Well, welcome to study number eight in this series called simply The Next Step. Uh, coming back to this, this whole matter of now our being a family. And I hope that uh, we'll take the opportunity through this study to uh, enjoy the Father. That's really what the, the theme is. We are, um, in the way the Bible thinks about the church, we are meant to be a family. And uh, that's always our aspiration, what we're, we're always seeking to express and ensure is experienced in our life as a fellowship of God's people. And that's what the, the letter to the Ephesians in very large measure is, is on about, uh, helping us to understand what it is to be the family of God. So we made a start in uh, chapter 1, um, verses 1 to 14, really just uh, Paul's great doxology, uh, sending out the praise of God. Um, and the, the privilege of being a part of that royal family. And then in these verses, 15 to 23, um, it, it's very much a prayer. The whole thing is a prayer. And he's praying, really, that uh, it may be uh, a context, the family context, in which we, we flourish. I mentioned on Sunday morning a couple of verses from the Psalms, Psalm 52 and Psalm 92. Uh, both of them have uh, that reference to the righteous flourishing in the courts of God in the house of the Lord. Uh, and that is what uh, we are meant to uh, ensure happens uh, experientially that we flourish, we uh, begin to grow and to blossom as individuals. And uh, that doesn't happen automatically, doesn't happen magically. Um, and it is ultimately something that God himself uh, clearly generates. So it is by the grace of God that we uh, flourish in that manner. And that's why Paul is praying as he does, praying for believers. So he's not praying that they'll come to faith, but they will grow in that faith. And um, there are the three strands to his prayer, um, uh, of which we only really addressed one on Sunday past, uh, the first. And that first one I put in terms of our enjoying the Father, the second was embracing the future, and the third was in experiencing uh, the fullness. Uh, we will come back to that, but uh, one of the things I forgot to do last week, uh, largely because I had computer problems, and um, that, that uh, kind of put a bit of pressure on, and uh, I omitted to underline what the key questions might be for this week's study, for those of you who, uh, who never managed to do more than just one or two. And I suggest this week that the key questions would be questions one, three, and four, um, uh, really obviously in the, the first part of the passage. Uh, because we didn't get much further than that. So questions one, three, and four are probably the key questions for this week. Um, as I thought about it after Sunday, it did seem to me that it was perhaps for a variety of reasons in the providence of God that we didn't actually get as far as I thought we might get, so that instead of covering all three strands, we actually only covered the first strand, which has to do with our enjoying the Father. That's really verse 17, where Paul prays that... Uh, uh, they may come to know the Father, may know God better. And it did occur to me that, that perhaps one of the reasons why in the providence of God we kind of got stuck on that one was because for many people this actually is a big, big hurdle, uh, something that they really struggle with. Um, uh, they, they know God, they trust in God, they, they have some experience of God, but there's a, a measure of, of fear, a measure of trepidation, a measure of uh, just not quite being comfortable in God's presence. And uh, the more we know him, the better we enjoy him. And that's really what Paul is praying, that we might know and enjoy the Father. So that's what this study really is concerned to uh, help you move towards. Um, and so without further ado from me, uh, we'll move on to question one. Now this first question um, is there... Uh, simply to get you thinking about the extent to which and indeed the ways in which you yourself have been growing in Christ. The ways in which you have um, been conscious of flourishing, as it were, in the courts of the Lord. Paul, uh, David's uh, words in Psalm 52, uh, I am like an olive tree uh, and flourishing in the courts of God. 
Um, so what ways would that be true of you? How are you conscious of that? Uh, it's flourishing a word that you would use and what has the Lord helped you, uh, helped you uh, to, to bring about that sort of growth? So that's really um, just designed to get you thinking along these lines of flourishing, what that might look like in your experience and the experience of others and uh, how that happens. So on to question two. Now, in this question, which really focuses on verse 15, pure and simple, where he describes the Christians, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. Uh, in this question, I really wanted to give uh, some thought to the way in which these believers are characterized by Paul. Uh, their faith, not just faith generally, but very specifically their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the Lordship of Jesus look like and mean in your life? What are the struggles that you have, uh, have had or are having uh, in embracing the Lordship of Jesus? And your love for all the saints, uh, what does that mean? Uh, your love for all the saints, all believers, because uh, believers are described in the scriptures as the saints, the set apart ones. Um, and, and what about your love for all the saints? What about the awkward ones? Uh, what about the faraway ones, people who uh, live in a faraway land, people who are the deceased ones as well? Our love for all the saints. The communion of saints is a, a reality to which the scriptures point and a reality that one day we will indeed enjoy to the full. And clearly the love for all the saints encompasses uh, all believers, wherever they may be, and uh, whoever they may be within the fellowship as well. So that's question two. On to question three, verse 16. You see in this question that it focuses on verse 16, where Paul uh, speaks about the way in which, as he remembers them in his prayers, he is always giving thanks for them. Paul's prayers are uh, an interesting study in themselves through the letters of the New Testament in most cases, perhaps almost invariably, I think, uh, he is actually praying in relation to specific areas of spiritual growth for uh, the believers for whom he's praying. And what I, I wanted you to be doing in this question is giving some thought to how uh, you and I might best develop that sort of praying uh, for ourselves in our own individual lives, but also uh, as a fellowship as well. You develop that um, without it becoming just a kind of routine. We can easily form lists and say, we'll pray for this person and that person and do it um, by rote as it will. How do you avoid it becoming just a, an empty routine? And how do we ensure that we are indeed giving uh, thanks to God for the individual's that we pray for. It's a, a useful exercise, in fact, a, a very helpful discipline to cultivate as you remember particular people to, uh, to be thinking of what it is about them that you would give thanks to God for um, very specifically. Uh, you want to run through uh, the last chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, for instance, and you see there uh, that in relation to the, uh, the whole catalogue of individuals that he mentions, uh, there's, generally speaking, one thing, at least, that he, he highlights about them. And that can be a useful discipline to, to think, what is it about that person as I pray for them, for which I'm uh, particularly thankful? And instead of simply keeping at an ac academic level, theoretical level, I've suggested uh, a little bit of practical work for you as well. Uh, so try praying for five individuals like that, uh, that you, you know and giving thanks for each one. So, verse uh, 17 and question four. Now, 
Now, this verse, I suppose, really is the verse on which we majored on Sunday morning past. And, and it, it really addresses the question, um, how do you get to know God better? That's the burden of Paul's prayer, that they may uh, know him better. How do we get to know God better? Uh, there is a, a standard answer that is true, obviously, and it's a standard answer that is incorporated into the children's song, uh, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Um, very simple, very straightforward, and we could kind of move on from there and say, well, that's all you do. You just read your Bible and pray, and uh, there you go, abracadabra, uh, you'll grow. Uh, there is truth, obviously, in that, but what I, I wanted you to think through is, is really the terms that Paul uses in this prayer because he, he doesn't simply pray that they may know him better. He prays very particularly to that end that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that thereby you may know him better. And I suggest in Sunday that uh, really the, the whole Trinity is involved in this. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the God whom we come to know is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I was underlining the importance there of uh, what I call the visible, or perhaps uh, we might almost say the physical, actually encountering uh, God in the person of Jesus, one whom they could see, one whom they could hear, one whom they could touch, one whose arms they could feel around them as he embraced them and reassured them, uh, that sort of um, physicality and visibility, the importance of that in the life of a fellowship. Uh, it's one of the disadvantages of our being confined at the moment. Uh, we simply don't have that sort of physical engagement with one another. And it is, from the way that Paul speaks here, it is um, as much through that as well. Um, Jesus saying to, to Philip, um, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, you get to know Jesus, you get to know the Father because what you see in him, uh, you're seeing the Father there. And it is in the, um, the love that Christians have, the one for the other within a fellowship, uh, as they see that, as we experience that, that we come to know and find comfort in the uh, fatherhood of God. That's one dimension of it, uh, the visible or the physical. The second dimension that I, I was trying to draw out is really uh, tied up in the designation that Paul gives to God as the glorious father or the father of glory. And that underlines the importance, uh, as I tried to explain the importance of the experiential. And I made reference there to Second Corinthians chapter seven, um, Second Chronicles chapter seven, uh, the opening few verses there, the dedication of the temple, where the glory of the Lord is, is something very, very experiential um, that occasions uh, reverence, um, the fear of the Lord, but not in a, a cowering, terrorized fear, so much as a delighted awe, a reverence, and also um, just a, a hearts being warmed by the knowledge of his goodness and his love. He is good, his love endures forever. That's what they were crying out as they fell to the ground before the glory of the Lord. Such was the experience of God's glory. Um, and wrapped up in that was the, the wonder at the constancy of his everlasting love. And uh, uh, how do we cultivate in the, uh, the life, and more particularly, I suppose, in the worship of the congregation, that experiential awareness of the, the majesty and the greatness of God? Um, so much in worship can be really quite, uh, quite superficial, quite uh, light, and uh, however, however bouncy and however um, moving it might be in some regards for us, um, it doesn't always convey the, uh, the, the weight, as it were, of the glory of God. There is a weightiness about the glory of God experientially that uh, um, fills our hearts with a, a delight in uh, that's our Father, full of that glory. 
And then the third, third strand to this that I stressed was the, um, the importance of what I call the intellectual, our understanding. And uh, that's the reference that Paul makes there to the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the, uh, the spirit of God who uh, authored the word of God and through that reveals God and the spirit of wisdom who opens our eyes and gives to us understanding. And so we are very much reliant upon the Holy Spirit ministering through his words and teaching us of the Father through his word. And that, as I say, in some ways is, is the pivotal verse that we looked at on Sunday and certainly therefore one of the key questions for us today. And uh, on then to question five. Now, I hope that uh, we will look at this strand of Paul's prayer, and indeed the one after that, um, in greater detail um, this coming Sunday. Uh, my hope behind this question is, is really just the desire to help us see that the way Paul describes our hope in this verse, verse 18, uh, gives some stress to the delight that God has in us as his children. Uh, it is his inheritance in the saints as much as ever it is our inheritance. And uh, we can easily miss that particular uh, slant. And it's quite an important one, the, the recognition that, that God actually views his, his church as his inheritance. Um, so that it's, it's not just that we inherit all the riches of heaven and all the blessings of heaven, but that... Uh, uh, the, the hope that we have is one in which we are his inheritance. And that's uh, question five. So question six. Now question six begins to pick up on the, the third strand of Paul's prayer, which has to do with the um, the awareness on the part of the Ephesian Christians of what he calls his incomparably great power for us who believe. And uh, verses 19 to 23 incorpor incorporate the, the substance of this strand. Uh, and Paul spends the longest amount of space and time on this aspect of his prayer, not so much, I think, because it's the most important as, I suppose, because the power of God at work in the lives of believers is, as he puts it, so incomparably great. He's got nothing to compare it with, and therefore he has to, to try and, uh, and explain by the sheer uh, amount of analogy um, the greatness of the power that belongs to to, to God and is now for us who believe. And he compares that obviously um, with the resurrecting power of God whereby Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, that power of God where not only did he raise him from the dead, that's one thing, but beyond that he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That's a, a whole different degree of the power of God. And beyond that as well, uh, he has placed him far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Um, so uh, it, it is that sort of power that elevates Jesus to the absolute supreme point. Um, there is no power that begins to compare with it. And that's what uh, Paul is pointing to in these verses. So on to the final question, question 7 and verses 22 to 23. Now I suggested in regard to the final couple of verses of the chapter and the passage that we're looking at, that uh, it's, it's worthwhile just taking a, a quick squint at Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 28, the, uh, the Great Commission, and also Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11 where um, the same notion is, um, is set out, the, the name that is above 
all names, uh, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And as believers, both the authority of Jesus, which is stressed in Matthew chapter 28 by Jesus, and the power of the Spirit, which is stressed by him at the start of the book of Acts and the end of uh, Luke's gospel, both the authority of Jesus and the power of the Spirit are underlined for us always in the context of the commission that we've been given to bear witness to Jesus and to make disciples of all nations. And um, it's, it's against that backdrop, really, that uh, uh, this is written, uh, so that we might understand that the power that is given to us is a power to bear witness to him. The authority that he has is an authority under which we then go in his name to make disciples of all nations. We don't go in our own name, uh, we go in his name. We don't go in our own strength, we go in the strength and power of his spirit. And the picture of the body which Paul brings in at verse 23 um, simply underlines and makes it clear that uh, only together are we really able to bring Jesus to the world. The, the New Testament simply does not understand, does not recognize the notion of a solitary Christian, as though you could live out your Christian life on your own. You can't be the body of Christ on your own. Uh, you are only ever at best uh, one small member of the body of Christ and only as the members together are functioning together are they able as the body of Christ to bear witness to the glory of Christ and secure the extension of the kingdom of Christ as well. And uh, so I hope that uh, you found this study useful. Um, we will be coming back to uh, the two latter strands of Paul's prayer um, this coming Sunday and looking in greater detail at that. But um, this study on the theme of flourishing, I hope that's proved um, helpful for you. And it is always our prayer that we will flourish as the people of God. Enjoy your week and uh, may God's blessing rest on you all.